Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's lovely to be here and to have braved the worst that the British weather can do. So, just later. Um, let me tell you how I um, landed on this subject. It, it, the story goes back a long way, actually, before I um, began in ministry. About, um, oh, I'm guessing about 12 years ago, I had a phone call one day from the youth worker at the church I was then a member of. And um, I don't know why she phoned me, because um, I didn't have any theological training, and I guess she'd been down the membership list and had got as far as P, I think, maybe. Um, but she said to me, um, Helen, one of our young people has been reading her Old Testament and is in danger of losing her faith because of some of the stories she's finding there. Um, what can I say to her? And I've no idea what I said, but I'm quite sure it was nothing very useful. But the question didn't go away. So when I um, came to do my master's uh, a few years later, um, I chose that subject for my dissertation um, and didn't imagine I bottomed it out, but certainly thought I might have said something of use, but the question still didn't go away. And so when I was asked to do the Whitley Lecture, um, this is what came back. And in fact, it's my it's question, it's the area of my ongoing research, really. Um, so, let's begin. The Old Testament has many gruesome and violent narratives. What are we supposed to make of them? Are we always supposed to approve of them? To enjoy them? Are we supposed to see them as a negative example? Or should we perhaps ignore them altogether? How do we read the Old Testament texts of violence? And in particular, how do we read them ethically? I'm very disturbed uh, by the use to which some of these Old Testament stories have been put over the years. Consider the Amalekites. They were the archetypal enemies of the people of Israel, and they were to be entirely obliterated, according to several texts in the Old Testament. This is an example from Deuteronomy, but it's by no means the only one. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary, and struck down all who lagged behind you. He did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies on every hand, in the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. Now these texts have provided inspiration for those who sought to rally support for the Crusades. And they were used to justify a religious war during the Reformation. And they were used to promote the ideology of degeneracy, that some people are too corrupt in hereditary terms to be permitted to procreate. And I'm sure you know that degeneracy theory was the father of the more modern eugenics movement. And these texts were even used to whip up hatred against the Tutsis during the Rwandan genocide. This is a picture of skulls stored in a church in Kigali, just a few of many who were slain in that church. And the murderers had been alerted to the presence of the people who were sheltering there by their priest. The hermeneutics of these texts is a huge and complex subject, and it's beyond the scope of today's lecture. But the question I would like us to think about is how we read them ethically. Now, I've argued in my written paper, which is obviously a fuller version of what I'm going to say today, um, but I'm going to take it as read today, that these texts are not to be taken normatively. In other words, it shouldn't automatically be assumed that these are intended to describe how things ought to be. But normative or not, these are texts that do something. Some written or spoken words have a stronger effect than others. In 1955, a scholar called J.L. Austin delivered a series of lectures which represented a huge move forward in literary <coughs> theory. These lectures were later published in the now well-known book, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with it, How to Do Things with Words. Austin showed us that some utterances, and by the term utterance, I simply mean a verbal or written um, form of communication, or gobbit of communication. Some utterances have an effect that is deeper than their simple propositional content. So let's use an example that he uses. Um, imagine the words, there is a bull in this field. Now, you and I all know the essential content of what is being said in that sentence. But the force of what I'm saying will depend on who I'm speaking to. 
So if you are a prospective purchaser of that bull and you have turned up with your cash in hand and you cannot see the animal in the field, then my words, there is a bull in this field, will have one force. If you are a group of ramblers who look as if you might not outrun the animal on a 100 metre sprint, then it'll have a quite different force. The terms that are used are the locutionary content, the actual um, propositional content of what is contained, the force, which is what I've just been talking about, and then the effect that it has on the listener, the perlocutionary effect. And so, going back to the bull in the field example, the effect of my utterance will also vary. It might convey fear, it might convey reassurance. Words can do something. This is known as speech act theory. Now my argument in this lecture is that texts of violence constitute a speech act. In other words, they do something to the reader. Consider the documents of the Holocaust. It's been argued that they amount to a morally binding statement because once we have read them, we are under an ethical obligation to resist such deeds in our own time. As scholar Edith Vishagrod has argued, it makes no difference how recent or remote those events are. Reading about them imposes a responsibility upon the reader. And I would argue then that the Old Testament texts of violence function in much the same way. Reading them places us under a responsibility. The act of reading cannot be neutral. But how do we discern the nature of that responsibility. So my questions for us to consider today are these. What, if anything, are these texts doing to us as we read them? How are we supposed to respond to them? And what tools can be used to try to find this out? Now, I'm under no illusions that I'm going to say the final word on this subject, um, but I'm going to offer, as a partial and incomplete answer, five suggested principles of how we might read these texts ethically with these questions in mind. And I very much see this as opening conversation, and I hope the conversation will continue after I've finished, and maybe in days and weeks to come. So my first suggestion is this, that we wrestle. Some of you, perhaps all of you, will be familiar with the work of Hans Georg Gadamer. Arguing pragmatically, Gadamer writes that meaning emerges from a text when its own horizon becomes merged with that of the reader. And a horizon, as you probably know, um, as the term is used by Gadamer, refers to the standpoint of, uh, of reader or writer which limits their view of reality. So for Gadamer, the interpretive act takes place, or meaning emerges, when the two horizons are fused. This is closely related to um, what I'm sure is also familiar to you, the idea of the hermeneutical spiral, where the initial preconceptions of the reader, which is the reader's initial horizon, provide a starting point for a provisional interpretation of the text. And that interpretation then goes on to modify the reader's original starting point, which then in turn permits <coughs> a better interpretation. This is standard hermeneutical theory, and I'm guessing it's familiar to most of you. Now, this idea of the text being in conversation with the reader is fundamental to the work of Michal Bakhtin. Bakhtin may not be so familiar to you. Um, I'll just say a word or two about him. He was a Russian scholar um, living during the time of the Soviet Union. It's a bit of a sad story, really, because um, most of his work was suppressed by the government of the day. Um, and, in fact, he, most of it was published posthumously, which um, does mean that many of the writers um, who would have interacted with his work and should have interacted with his work, didn't, because they hadn't yet <coughs> encountered it. A sad story about Bakhtin was that he was in internal exile um, for years. At one point, one of his books was with the publisher, and uh, back in the day before we made hard copy backups, he had one backup copy, so two copies, one with the publisher, which was bombed and destroyed, and his own backup copy, and he was in internal exile, and was so miserable that he smoked his way through it. So we don't have that particular work because it was destroyed. But Bakhtin um, doesn't wholly agree with Gadamer because in Bakhtin's analysis, horizons don't become fused, but they remain in dialogue with one another. 
Bactine identifies dialogue within texts, which we're going to discuss a little later, and between texts and their readers. For Bakhtin, meaning is found where voices clash. And this is somewhat similar to the work of Wayne Booth, who is one of the scholars who no doubt would have interacted with Bakhtin if he could have done. And Booth argues that when we read a book, we give ourselves in conversation to its author. Now, I think it'll be obvious that such a conversation may have ethical consequences. Indeed, it may have a transforming effect. It may shape our opinions. It may shape our character. As Kevin Van Hooser argues, we are a product of what we read. Now, if this is true for normal works of fiction and non-fiction, how much more is it true of the Bible? The work of the Spirit in biblical interpretation is often overlooked by hermeneutical theorists, and uh, if time permitted, it would be interesting to have a conversation about why that might be. Um, but Karl Barth is one uh, notable exception to that general rule. Karl Barth's understanding of the Bible becoming the word of God to us as we read it is absolutely based upon the belief that reading the Bible is different from reading any other book and constitutes an encounter with the divine author. So, if reading is a conversation with the author, and reading the Bible is a conversation with the divine author, where does wrestling fit in here? What are our options as we approach one of the ethically challenging texts in the Old Testament? In general discourse, um, which basically means in personal conversation and on social media, I've observed two main approaches taken to this problem. And the first approach, which I find tends to be offered by people of more conservative stance, is a refusal to acknowledge any difficulty with the text. Now, I find it hard to believe that any of us could be calm or dispassionate if we were standing watching some of the gruesome events we read about in Joshua, for example. And so to deny that these texts raise challenging questions seems to me to be dishonest. <coughs> The second option which I observe, and this one generally among those of a more liberal inclination, is a wholesale rejection of the texts, sometimes of the entire Old Testament. And such voices, I would suggest, have not taken seriously enough the importance of the Old Testament to the New. The third century heretic Marcion appears to be alive and well in parts of the UK church today. When we're faced with a conflict between our beliefs and the evidence we're presented with, we have a number of options. And psychologically, one of the most appealing ways to deal with this is to adopt what is known as a comfortable theory. Comfortable theory permits us to maintain our beliefs with the minimum amount of effort. It's a theory which, when we're torn between two explanations for a problem, is the least challenging for us to adopt. It's the path, if you like, of least resistance. I think comfortable theories are lazy and dishonest. And I suggest that both of these options can tend towards the use of comfortable theories and of cognitive dissonance. So is there a third option? Perhaps the biblical model which can be helpful here is the image of Jacob wrestling with God. I'm sure it's very familiar to you. But uh, you remember at the end of that incident, when he has wrestled with the deity and has prevailed, he is renamed Israel, he who wrestles with God. And it is no coincidence that the nation which Jacob um, fathers is named not Jacob, but Israel. It is that name, he who wrestles with God, which is taken <coughs> by the nation itself. Walter Bugerman argues that wrestling with God is found within the text of the Old Testament itself. He describes this in his account of the Old Testament as testimony and counter-testimony. You may be familiar with that, but in case you're not, let me give you an example very briefly. Um, the book of Proverbs, speaking rather as a generalisation, but perhaps not too dreadful a one. The book of Proverbs pretty much has a theology that if you are righteous, you will prosper. God will cause you to prosper. The book of, that would be testimony in uh, Bugerman's um, um, uh, language. Um, book of Job says of that, yeah, right. That would be counter-testimony. 
With regard to the texts of male or female violence in the Old Testament, Phyllis Tribble describes her preferred hermeneutical approach in this way. We struggle mightily only to be wounded, but yet we hold on seeking a blessing. And I suggest that as we engage with these ethically challenging stories, a more faithful approach than ignoring them, or simply assenting that they are fine, is to struggle with them, to wrestle with them. And in doing so, to wrestle in conversation with the divine author. But we must beware, because as Jacob shows us, and as Job proves, and as Van Hooser argues, such a conversation, such a wrestling match will not leave us unaltered. And we may leave limping, we may be scarred, we might lose the wrestling match. And now we come to my second suggested principle to guide us as we seek an ethical response to these texts. And this is that we move, if we need to, from an attitude of apathy to one of empathy, or if you like, from indifference to lament. Telling the truth about acts of violence can be a matter of seeking justice, an act of integrity, as in this ex example of investigative journalism from a couple of years ago. Or it can be a prurient, voyeuristic exercise, titillating the reader, often for commercial benefit. In contrast to many of the tabloid newspapers or pulp fiction paperbacks of today, the Old Testament is generally quite sparse in its narration of violence. Consider this description of one of the most horrific moments in biblical history, the rape of the Levite's concubine. I'm going to come back to this text again a little later. This is the heart of the story. So the man seized his concubine and put her out to them. They wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. As morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. There is no graphic detail. There is no pornography. There is no prurient focus upon the woman's anguish. I was saying to somebody just a couple of days ago, if this was Game of Thrones, it would be represented quite differently. But here the narrator draws a tender veil over her suffering. It's enough to tell us that she endured it without lingering over the details. It is important, incidentally, that we distinguish between the way that a character is treated in the narrative and the way that a character is treated by the narrative. And we'll return to this point a little later. So an ethical reading of such texts will take its cue from the narrator's discrete distance. Now, you're probably wondering why I would feel the need to emphasise that the Bible should not be read for pornography or titillation. Well, this is an online computer game for young children. You find it, simple Google search. It's tagged by the designer as a, quote, Christ game, unquote. In order to win, a player has to defend the Ark of the Covenant, which is that peculiar-looking thing on the left-hand side, from the evil Midianites, who are the guys in the red caps, which will, of course, involve killing as many of them as possible. Is that okay? I think that wholesale slaughter should not be a cause of amusement for junior age children, or of anyone for that matter. It should not be a source of glee. The scientific evidence in adults, the deep and prolonged immersion in texts where the deity sanctions killing, increases aggression. And if it's doing that to adults, what's it doing to children? Now, I'm not suggesting that we should censor the Old Testament but I do believe we should pay careful attention to how the stories are told and used in our churches. In his prescient book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, published a while ago now, but still remarkably relevant, Neil Postman argues that some means of communication are inherently unfit for the thoughtful and sensitive ethical discussion of serious matters. Speaking about the television of news, he says this, we're presented not only with fragmented news, 
but news without context, without consequences, without value, and therefore without essential seriousness. That is to say, news as pure entertainment. Taking his point at its broadest, his book is a sharp critique of the trivialization of the deadly serious. And the danger, I think, is that we may become immune to the violence of the stories we are reading. We may allow them to brutalize us rather than sensitize us. Consider these insouciant words written by the eminent biblical archaeologist William Foxwell Albright, who says this. Strictly speaking, this Semitic custom of total destruction was no worse from a humanitarian point of view than the reciprocal massacres of Protestants and Catholics in the 17th century. It is questionable whether a strictly detached observer would consider it as bad as the starvation of helpless Germany after the armistice in 1918 or the bombing of Rotterdam in 1940. I don't know about you, but I find the concept of a strictly detached observer rather uncomfortable. More helpful, perhaps, is the advice of Denise Ackerman, who writes this. I suggest that the ancient language of lament offers a vehicle for expressing raw emotions arising from situations such as Tamar, as she's speaking about the rape of Tamar in Samuel. The language of lament also offers the body of Christ the opportunity to say this. We are suffering. We stand in solidarity with all who suffer. We lament while we believe that there is hope for all in the good news. Whatever else these texts are doing to us, they are describing brutalities that still occur today. And at the very least, they should cause us to lament and be attentive to modern victims of violence. So we come to my third suggestion. And this is that in true London underground style, we must mind the gaps. We must notice what the text is not saying, who is not speaking, and what is not being expressed. What do I mean by this? The philosopher, literary critic, and social historian Michel Foucault has described a number of overlapping processes by which discourse is, to use his term, rarefied. By this, Foucault is referring to the use of power to restrict or control discourse. In actual fact, Foucault views discourse as fundamentally an act of violence. It might be helpful at this point to comment that Foucault sees his work as a descriptive tool for understanding the ways that texts function. And it's not necessary to subscribe to his entire system of thought, which leans heavily towards scepticism, in order to benefit from his approach. This table shows some of the ways in which Foucault suggests that language can be controlled or manipulated. One of the easiest ways to restrict expression is to exclude individuals from the public discourse. Um, the silencing of women from suffrage in our own country until very recently, or the silencing of women under the Taliban until very, very recently, would be good examples of this rarefaction. So Foucault encourages us to notice the structures and systems of power and control in our texts, to mind the gaps, if you like. Is this a helpful way forward for approaching these ethically challenging texts? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. The problem is that Foucault hardly needs to get out of bed to show us that the Old Testament is written in a context of male privilege and dominance, and that these values can sometimes be found within the text itself. That is clear, and I imagine uncontroversial. But a thoughtful and perhaps deeper application of his ideas can reveal cross-currents within the text, which may prove very enlightening. The challenge is to identify the voices that are suppressed by the text and notice the surprising ones that are not. Allow me to illustrate this with two examples from the so-called texts of terror. This is a term that Phyllis Tribble coined for five texts of male-on-female violence in the Hebrew Bible. First, we consider the rape of Tamar. If you've forgotten it or never read it, it's the story of a ro royal prince raping his half-sister and of her consequent ruin. 
In this story, Tribble identifies the surprising clarity of the victim's voice as she speaks with dignity and wisdom. No, my brother, do not force me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do anything so vile. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the scoundrels in Israel. Now, therefore, I beg of you, speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. And after the crime, she says, no, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other you did to me. And notice, please, the difference between the treatment of the woman within the narrative and her treatment by the narrator. By her rapist, the woman is violated and ruined. But by the narrator, her memory is retold with tenderness and compassion. Her name is memorialised and her dignity is esteemed. Even more surprising, I think, is the account of the Levite's concubine in Judges 19. I mentioned it earlier. Um, <coughs> if you're not familiar with the story, it's the account of the gang rape, murder and dismemberment of an unnamed concubine of a Levite in the pre-monarchical pre days of Israel. Now here I differ from Tribble and some of the other feminists in how I read this story. Because they consider that the narrator has no interest in the victim of the crime since he neither names her nor dwells on the details of her torture. Tribble says this, the power struggle between the two men highlights the plight of the woman who brought them together, but whom they and the storyteller ignore. And she says, the crime itself receives few words. If the storyteller advocates neither pornography nor sensationalism, he also cares little about the woman's fate. My first comment is that Tribble fails to take due account of the fact that no one in this story is named. And this may be a literary device to give the story a more general applicability. In other words, saying something like, this isn't just what happened to one woman, it's the sort of thing that used to happen all the time. Anonymity can function that way in a text. But there's a second key point which I think Tribble overlooks. What we need to understand is that the key purpose of the Book of Judges, read synchronically, is Israel's need for a king. So the narrator tells us several times, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And to that end, we are given a number of stories of anarchy and horror, which spiral rapidly in the extremes of their violence. And the climax of those stories is this one and its sequel. When he, and the narrator surely is a he, when he wants to put the final nail in the coffin of Israel's ungodly chaos, he tells us this story of the rape and murder of a nameless woman. Not a man, not even a high-ranking wife, a nameless nobody, a concubine. Judith Butler would put it like this, the concubine's life is grievable, it matters enough to be recorded. It matters enough to be remembered. It matters enough that we're still talking about it today, thousands of years later. The memorialisation of this woman's savage death places her right at the centre of societal concern, or at least of the concern of the author. Foucault, no doubt, would critique the underlying patriarchy of the text. And he's probably right. But the use of his technique to analyse the unexpected power dynamics in this story show us how the text holds her with surprising tenderness. And thirdly, we should note how Foucault's technique can help us to notice the power plays that are at work as we interpret texts. For a long while, scholarly interpretation was largely the privilege of the white educated male. And rightly, the texts are now falling into the hands of a much wider range of interpretive communities. But let us not imagine that ideological power structures are thereby being demolished. Consider the story of the Exodus, widely regarded as being a liberatory text, and it has of course been adopted in recent decades by liberation theologians as their core narrative for the development of a theology that brings dignity and emancipation to the poor. But the danger is that the removal of one set of power structures often results in their replacement with another set. 
So let's listen to a Native American theologian commenting on how he views the Exodus stories. The obvious characters in the story for Native Americans to identify with are the Canaanites. As a member of the Asaji Nation of American Indians, I read the Exodus story with Canaanite eyes. And it is the Canaanite side of the story that has been overlooked by those seeking to articulate theologies of liberation. These texts belong to nobody, or to everybody. And the danger of their ideological appropriation, however well-intentioned, is that it can prove oppressive to others. We must mind the gaps and notice the power structures at work both within and without the text. Now we come to my fourth principle. And this is that we pay attention to the contexts. And I can hear you thinking you're teaching ready to suck eggs now. But notice that I said contexts in the plural. Of course, reading in context is part of the Bible reading 101 that I hope we all do and teach. But there may be deeper levels of context that we fail to consider. And here are some suggestions. First, we need to consider the framing of the narrative. Have a look at this picture. I hope you can see it. it may be familiar to you. I remember this moment. Um, my eldest daughter was four. And uh, we sat in the lounge and watched this happen, I think live. And I said to her, remember this moment. This is a historical moment. And of course she didn't. <laughs> this is the top photo of the toppling of Saddam Hussein's statue in Feodos Square, Baghdad, at the end of the Iraq War in 2003. And it shows us a large crowd of joyful Iraqis spontaneously pulling down the statue of their hated dictator. The photograph hasn't been photoshopped or doctored. It's an accurate representation of events. Or is it? This is the same photograph, uncropped. What do you notice that's different? Well, the crowd is a, a lot smaller than we might have thought. And we might notice the presence of American tanks parked at strategic points all the way around the square. This might not have been quite such a spontaneous uprising as it initially appeared. It all depends on how the image is framed. Another example took place not long before Christmas, um, and some of you may have heard the same interview. It was just after Trump had retweeted the Britain First video. Do you remember that? And uh, they interviewed, in actual fact, he hadn't directly retweeted them. He retweeted a woman's retweet of it. And they interviewed that, that woman, that uh, middle man, as it were, between the, the two, uh, on Radio Force Today programme. And they said to her, don't you think you should be more responsible in your use of what you tweet? And she said, no. And they said, don't you think you should check what a video is actually showing before you retweet it? And she replied, and she said it more than once, a video is a video, she said. But it isn't. It depends on the framing. This idea of framing is another insight that we owe to Judith Butler. She was the one who taught us about grievability. Butler teaches us that we need to pay attention to how images and stories are framed, how they're <coughs> presented, and where the boundaries are placed. Because how we respond to the story at the centre will depend upon the phrase, frame placed around it. So if we're going to read Old Testament texts of violence ethically, we should pay attention to the way that we present them, when we read them in our churches or when we tell them. Because if we don't, we may end up distorting their message. Let me give you an example. This is a kind of timeline of the early part of Joshua. Consider the story of the stoning of Achan, which is at the bottom of the slide there. It's an odd little story where a man and his family are executed for looting. What's going on? Were they the only people who looted the conquered city of Jericho? Were they scapegoated? Why is the language of total destruction, that's a technical term in the Old Testament, as you probably know, why is that used? Well, it can. But if we expand the frame of our reading, we'll find in the previous chapter a story which is almost the exact opposite in every way. Rahab, a pagan woman who should be subject to the total destruction order, is saved from it through an act of faith in God. These stories should definitely be read together. 
but neither will make sense unless they are. But really, we can only understand the conquest of Jericho if we've placed it in the frame of chapter 5, where Joshua meets a man with a drawn sword and has this conversation which should make our jaws drop. Are you for us or are our enemies, he asks. And the reply comes, neither. Neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. So we need to be really careful about where we begin and end our Bible readings in church. Where we begin or end the stories that we tell. But we also need to consider the contemporary frame or context in which a story is told or read. So perhaps, for example, there are certain narratives that we shouldn't read on Remembrance Day because of the possibility of them being interpreted in a way that will fuel nationalism or jingoism. Or perhaps there are certain stories in the Old Testament which would be particularly effective to read on that day because of their similarity to modern events or because they subvert uncritical enthusiasm for war making. That's framing. But there are other contexts which need to be considered as we approach a text. And now we'll consider polyphony, which we touched on very briefly earlier. Back to Mikhail Bakhtin, the Russian literary theorist. He speaks of polyphony as the presence of unmerged voices within the text. And this is the key thing, none of which has a privileged position over the other. Now these voices can be, but need not be, those of characters within a narrative conversing with one another. But they might also, in our multi-authored Bibles, be the different contributors who have written at different times from their own particular perspectives, and who do not, let's be honest about this, always see things the same way. And Bakhtin's work urges us not to be disconcerted by this, because we recall for Bakhtin, truth is discerned at the meeting of these voices. They're not to be fused or blended in a compromised middle ground. They should be allowed to speak and play and dialogue. And this is part of the context that I think we should consider as we approach the difficult texts. So, for example, in 2 Kings 9 to 10, we read of an awful, a bloody coup by one Jehu, who slaughters the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the entire royal family of the northern kingdom in one great bloodbath. And it may be rather disturbing for us to read the author of the Book of Kings taking pains to tell us how God is using Jehu to bring about judgment on the house of Ahab for Ahab's actions over poor dead Naboth. But attend to the polyphonic context, and we have to notice that in Hosea, the actions of Jehu are subject to God's criticism and judgment. Or we might consider the really difficult prophecy of Nahum, focused on the pagan city of Nineveh and how she will be getting her comeuppance for all her evil and idolatry. But we mustn't read it without remembering the story of Jonah, where God's tenderness to that same city is revealed. Truth is found at the point where these voices come into dialogue. And an ethical reading of these texts will allow these dialogues to play. Now, third context relates to the horizons with, within which a story is placed. Now, I spoke earlier about the two horizons idea of Gadamer, also used by Thistleton, but the way I'm using the term now is slightly different. The three horizons of interpretation were set out by Edmund Clowney in a book on homiletics. Clowney's what he's setting out is the three horizons, which are the three stages in preparing a text for preaching. Now, his first horizon is familiar to us all, and it's the textual one. And we all know that we shouldn't move to any further steps in hermeneutics until we've performed a thorough and rigorous exegesis of the text itself in its own immediate context. But after this lie two theological horizons, and they're quite different from one another, and they must be performed in order. First, there is the epochal horizon. Simply put, where are we in the story so far? And at this point, we're not supposed to remember anything that comes later. This can be a challenge, I know, with texts that are not necessarily written in the order of the events they narrate, but we do our best with it. 
And certainly the New Testament is inadmissible when we're considering the epochal horizon of any Old Testament text. And finally, and only once we have done these first two steps, we can bring in the canonical horizon. And sigh a deep breath as we bring Jesus into the picture. And we consider the narrative in the context of the whole testimony of Scripture. Now, within this canonical consideration of the text, I'd like to suggest that there are three points of privilege, three places where we get a glimpse of what is normative. First, there is the Garden of Eden before the fall. And here we see the non-competitive relationship between the man and the woman, who have been placed in the garden by a God who is created out of love and with no violence, in stark distinction to the other ancient Near Eastern creation myths. At the opposite end to this creational point of privilege is the eschatological one, where the tree of life is offered for the healing of the nations, and where the exclusion of murderers shows that life in the New Jerusalem is intrinsically non-violent. And the third point of privilege, of course, lies within the centre of those, that supreme moment of revelation where God himself comes and dwells among us. All the other points in the story, I suggest, carry a sense of contingency, of God's people trying to live ethically in an unethical, broken world, and always failing to a greater or lesser degree. I visualise it a bit like this. There are three points in history which give us, if you like, an ethical fix. One at the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. And they form a sort of triple tether on the buzzing timeline that is history. And every other narrative is just an approximation of how life is meant to be lived. Now, I've described in the written version of my paper some caveats around our ability to interpret even those three points of privilege, in as much as they're narrated and interpreted in a fallen world and within a particular sits in Laban, which is itself fallen. So if you feel that I haven't done this subject enough justice, then please read the full paper before you uh, email me. <laughs> but do email me. What all this amounts to, of course, is a plea to do biblical theology and to do it well. Christ is the final interpreter of the Old Testament texts. His cross is the final demonstration of the death of death, of the obliteration of violence, of the eclipse of evil. But we will not understand that interpretation of the texts at all if we do not first pay attention to them in their pre-Christ context. Nonetheless, biblical theology, which is an attempt to understand the developing theology through the whole Bible, is dependent, in my opinion, upon the faith commitment that these diverse texts demonstrate coherence, not uniformity, not total agreement, but that they testify to the same God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One example of what I think is good biblical theology is offered by Tremper Longman, who shows how the biblical view of warfare develops through the canon. See if you recognise his description here. First, God fights against the flesh and blood enemies of his people. And then, surprise, surprise, we discover that God fights against his people. Then the battlegrounds are partially redrawn eschatologically. Then we encounter Jesus Christ as the divine warrior who conquers through non-violent self-sacrifice. And finally, he is revealed as the eschatological warrior and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so finally, we come to my suggested fifth principle, the reading of text of violence ethically. And this is that we attend to the power of remembering and the power of forgetting. This is a picture of soldiers being evacuated from the beach at Dunkirk by a little flotilla of requisitioned pleasure craft. Probably a fairly familiar image to you. And this is London on VE Day. Perhaps those two stories in some way represent how we often choose to remember Britain's part during World War II. Doughty little Britain, who held on against impossible odds, stood alone against the evil of the Axis powers and snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Perhaps this image doesn't come so readily to our minds. This is a picture taken after the British firebombing of Dresden in 
when the incendiary devices were so close together and the fires are so intense that people within the zone died of suffocation through the oxygen consumption of the flames. Perhaps this isn't a part of the story we so often tell ourselves. History telling, John Van Seters tells us, is society rendering account to itself. History telling takes place through rituals, habits, memorials, and through official and unofficial storytelling. In other words, every time we tell a story concerning past events, we are being amateur historians. Every time we select this part of this big story for inclusion or that part for omission, we are constructing a history. And history telling is an ethical enterprise. Edith Vishagord again, we met her earlier, she writes this. History telling is not just making something transparent, it is a declaration of what is and what ought not to have been. And similarly, Svetan Todorov says, the work of the historian never consists solely in establishing the facts, but also in choosing certain among them as being more salient and more significant than others, and placing them in relation to one another. So history making can be used or abused. And along with this then, memory can be used or abused. And forgetting can be constructive or destructive. Paul Ricoeur stresses to us the importance of actively remembering for two particular reasons. First, because remembrance of the victim negates the celebration of the victor. And second, because remembrance can be a means of forgiveness and reconciliation. On the other hand, remembering can be an unhealthy thing, perpetuating cultural memories of victimhood and transmitting them generationally. I'd suggest that some of the marches and countermarches that take place in Ulster each summer fall into this category, as memories of events that are hundreds of years old are transmitted in live form to the next generation. Another danger of remembering is the establishment within a cultural mindset of what are called narrative templates. Narrative templates are recurring patterns within cultural or national history which then become normative for that society. They often become ethnocentrically particular and they can limit imaginative possibilities of new ways of being. I wonder if you can think of any cultural templates. Conversely, forgetting can be an ethically positive act. After all, we celebrate the fact that God chooses to remember our sins no more. But on the other hand, especially when forgetting is enforced, it can be an oppressive act. Constructive remembering and constructive forgetting were both seen in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to what, following the end of apartheid in South Africa, where violent and abusive actions were told and confessed and then a deliberate decision was made to remember them no more. So what do we do with all of this as we consider the stories from the Bible that we tell, the way we tell them, and the histories that we're constructing as we do so? A few comments on this. First, let us be attentive to the histories that we are constructing. A narrowly ethnocentric view of Israel, for example, is not sustained by the wider text of the Old Testament, where no nation is above reproach, and where unexpected people find themselves included into the people of God. Second, we should take care not to allow these stories to become narrative templates, to form unhealthy patterns of personal or community behaviour, and limit the imagination of alternative possibilities. In particular, we might consider the narrative template that seems to provide a framework for the conquest and occupation of parts of Palestine by modern Israel. It's important we think carefully about the theological relationship between the modern state of Israel and the ancient nation by the same name, and that we don't uncritically equate the two. And thirdly, we should weigh up the relative merits of remembering and forgetting the victims of these texts. In order for life to go on after a great evil, amnesia is sometimes necessary. But what are situations where life has gone on already for thousands of years? 
Does the risk to peace still trump the imperative to remember? It seems to me that with these ancient wrongs, the need for reconciliation and healing has largely lapsed, whereas the consequences of forgetting the victim continues to be very costly. The routine omission of the text of sexual violence from our Sunday services, for example, means that such crimes and their victims are still being obliterated from memory and excluded from discourse. In pastoral terms, this might represent a missed opportunity for remembering and honouring such victims, ancient and modern. Setting these narratives free in our congregations may allow them to have a voice and give words to their lament. So there are some serious outstanding theological questions about many of the Old Testament texts of violence, particularly those where God appears to command violent action. And I am only too well aware that this lecture has contributed little, if anything, to that debate. But I hope it has served as a call to take these texts very seriously and to read them ethically using every tool at our disposal. We need to decide whether we will ignore these stories and so silence the victims and allow people in our churches to stumble across them unprepared, or whether we will grasp the nettle, wrestle with them faithfully and honestly, without cognitive dissonance, and train the people in our churches to do the same. We need to decide whether we will allow these texts to brutalise us and our children, or whether we will let them sensitise us to the plight of the abused and the violated. We need to decide whether we will stand with the powerful and violent, or whether we will notice the systems of power at work within the ancient text and today, and attend to the unheard voices in our own society and give them expression. We need to decide whether we will read thinly and narrowly, or whether we will learn to identify the ways that the authors and the divine author are inviting us to read more richly. We need to decide whether we will allow these stories to become normative in our understanding, or whether we will read them as part of that great story that extends from creational shalom to eternal shalom, in which we are beckoned to live as though the reign of the Prince of Peace were already here. And with all God's people, we will long and work for the day when violence is no more. And we will pray, come Lord Jesus.